Good afternoon, everyone. We are on the brink of another Sabbath, but we are into the time for our Friday night chat. Welcome to uh, our August edition. We are praying that you will be blessed by the information that you will garner and our, uh, our speaker for this evening, our presenter, is none other than Sergeant Angela Berry. <laughs> Sergeant Berry is a native of Georgetown, Guyana, and has been a resident in Miami, Florida, uh, over 20 years in Miami-Dade County. Since 2003, Sergeant Berry has dedicated herself to serve her community as a committed member of the Miami-Dade Police Department, where she served several commendations, received several commendations and awards for her performance and dedication. She's also very devoted to her church and uh, she's a member of the Perrine SDA Church and they, they call themselves blessed to have Sergeant Berry as a member of their congregation. And tonight we are blessed to have her speak to us and give us some information. And as a matter of fact, she would love for us to speak with her. So I'm gonna turn it over to her, but I'd like to just let you know that if you have questions, if you have comments, please use the chat. And that is how she will get the information. That is how she'll get your questions. That's how she'll get your suggestions. So please use the chat as we go along. Welcome everyone to this meeting. Again, I pray that you will be blessed, doubly blessed, as we um, engage in this session together. And so at this time, as we are gonna turn over to Sergeant Berry, I will ask Sister George to pray our opening prayer. And after that, it will be in Sister Berry's hand. Thank you. Let us pray. Eternal Heavenly Father, we are so appreciative of the many blessings that you have brought our way during the course of this week. And tonight we have gathered, dear God, to just be fed once more. We thank you for <clears throat> providing individuals, capable individuals who will help us understand, dear God, um, what it means to be abused, how to identify those things, because as your children, you do not want such means for us, dear Father God. So we thank you so much for this opportunity. Thank you for the Sabbath day where we can rest from all of our cares of all, all our labors dear God and as we are about to go through this meeting I pray that everything will be that will be said will be directed from on high I pray in Jesus' name amen and amen 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 so here we go good evening uh, I don't know all the, there are many churches on here. So I just want to say good evening. Thank you. Happy Sabbath. Shabbat Shalom. It is a blessing to be here uh, with, with you all this evening. And we are going to share information. Um, I'm going to do a, a brief overview. As you know, the, uh, this year we're dealing with abuse of power. And so I'm going to go through abuse of power in the church, and also abuse of power that can be found in the family or home setting. I'm going to be brief um, because I really want to leave it open to, um, to discussion, okay, and, and questions so that we have more of a um, uh, discussion period together, if that's okay. I'm getting some questions on my on my screen should I be admitting people sister Davis or or you're doing that uh, we, we we're gonna look at we're gonna look at the questions and we will send them to you we will yes read read the ones that um yes that we we want you to be answered right now okay all right so let's them. begin let's begin so um Ellen White makes this statement where it says, many who profess to be the ministers of Christ are like the sons of Eli who ministered in the sacred office and took advantage of their office to engage in crime and commit adultery. 
causing the people to, con to transgress the law of God and fearful account will such have to render when the cases of all shall be passed in review before God and they be judged according to the deeds done in the body. As I said before, this year's emphasis for End It Now is on abuse of power, which is a very important um, area of abuse that we need to speak of because abuse is about power and control. So there's several writings and, and um, sermons and presentations that were sent down by the General Conference to address the topic. Um, I'll be referring to a few of those during our discussion this evening. So first, let's clarify that power can be abused by any person in any position. Um, this evening, we'll focus again on power that's found in the church, when we find the abuse of power in the church, as well as that is found in the family or the home. Regardless of who is perpetrating this abuse, it's still abuse, okay? Let me, I think I have one second. Okay, so let's go ahead and begin with prayer. Father God, we just thank you once again for allowing us to come and see another beautiful Sabbath. Lord God, we thank you for bringing us through the week. There's those that we know that may not have made it. This was a difficult week for so many of us. But Father God, we're still here. There's still work for us to do. And so we thank you, we praise you, we honor, glorify, and magnify you this evening as we come to discuss something that, that we know hurts you as our father, as we hurt and abuse one another. Lord God, help us to learn your will and your way. Be with me now as I speak. Holy Spirit, please speak for me and through me. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Mm -hmm. Abusers will use different types of abuse for their intended victim. It doesn't matter whether the abuse, the abuse is physical, emotional, economical, sexual, spiritual, it's all abuse. Sadly, people experience these abuses at the hands of those that they should be able to trust. People such as their teachers, police officers, counselors, coaches, bosses, spiritual leaders, family members, and even parents. For years, we've taught our children about stranger danger, the potential boogeyman, that person that they don't know and therefore shouldn't trust, the one that would take advantage of their innocence and would harm them. While putting these types of fears uh, into our children and giving these warnings, giving them these warnings, at no time did we prepare them for the dangers within. We never thought to caution them about the deacon that may get too close or the greeter that might hug them for too long or the pathfinder counselor that they are placed in the care of during campery. Right now we're talking about abuse of power in the church. We never consider the dangers that lie within what's supposed to be our safe space, the church. Our text for this evening comes from 1 Samuel 2, verses 12 to 17. That's 1 Samuel 2, verses 12 to 17. I did ask that someone read that for me. When okay. someone I don't, I don't, I don't think she got the message, so I'm going to go ahead. Sister Thank Freddie, you. Sister Freddie, did you see my message? Okay, so it's 12 to 17, I'm re reading from the New International Version. Go ahead, Sister Frederica. Okay, she's not. Okay. Mr. Frederica? I can give her, can give her okay. one of the other verses if you yes, want to okay. that one. Well, to 17, I'm going, I'm going ahead. 
Eli's sons were scoundrels. <laughs> they had no regard for the Lord. Now it was the practice of the priests that whenever any of the people offered a sacrifice, the priest's servants would come with a three-pronged fork in his hand while the meat was being boiled and would plunge the fork into the pan or kettle or cauldron or pot. Whatever the fork brought up, the priest would take for himself. This is how they treated all the Israelites who came to Shiloh. But even before the fat was burned, the priest's servant would come and say to the person who was sacrificing, give the priest some meat to roast. He won't accept boiled meat from you, but only raw. If the person said to him, let the fat be burned first and then take whatever you want, the servant would answer, no, hand it over now. If you don't, I'll take it by force. Verse 17, this sin of the young men was very great in the Lord's sight, for they were treating the Lord's offering with contempt. Have mercy. So this scripture uh, passage speaks about the evil doings of Eli's son. Verse 12 reads, and I used a new uh, King James Version is what I'm going from, is now the sons of Eli were corrupt. They did not know the Lord. So we must be mindful that simply because someone goes to church or serves in church doesn't mean that they know the Lord. The text states that they were corrupt. These brothers used their position to manipulate and abuse the people of God. They made demands that were against God's teachings and subjected the people that were going to the temple to do things that satisfied their selfish desire. Only certain portions of the sacrifices were to be given, to, uh, certain portions of the offerings were to be given to the priests, and the fat was never to be used, it was to be offered to God. But they became so blinded by their own desires that at the end of verse 16, it states that if the people did not comply, they would take whatever it was that they wanted by force, abuse of power in the church. Now, when we look at verse 22, Eli mentions that his sons went as far as to lay with the women who assembled at the door of the tabernacle of meeting. So let's look at the word abuse. When I look through different dictionaries and website definitions, some of the words continue to be the same. Improper use of something, cruelty, or violent treatment of a person or an animal, to harm or threaten to harm, exploitation. The list goes on as ways to express what constitutes abuse. In short, in every instance of abuse, there is the need to have power and control over something or someone. Abuse is about being able to control someone and being able to exert your power over them. This story is a perfect example of abusers that use multiple types of abuses. That is why it is important that people we place in positions of authority, people who find themselves in positions of authority are held responsible, responsible for the authority that we give them. In other words, what is their ability to respond to the authority that we trust them with? Unfortunately, the actions of Eli's sons were not limited to just this biblical story. We have modern day experiences and examples of abuse of power by clergy and other religious leaders that represent the church 
And this isn't limited to other religions and other practices or, or other denominations. We can find it right here in the Seventh-day Adventist church. We should be different, set apart. However, some of these same sins of the world has found themselves as a part of what is now in the Adventist church. Members that are abusive with their tongues, whether it be to the young people or to each other. Elders, deacons, teachers in our church schools, and even pastors that engage in inappropriate relationships with the members of the church. Some cases that, I've, that were brought to my attention, some cases that I've had to deal with was as disheartening as sexual relationships with our children. The Bible states in verse 17, therefore the sins of the young men were very great before the Lord. This is abuse of power in the church. Now I'm gonna move on to abuse of power that's found in the family setting. And very soon we'll open it up to questions and comments. So there are many ways that power can be abusive in the family. It can be through the control of finances, uh, what someone can wear, where they can go, who they can see, what they, what they can eat, act, interact. It can be more violent, such as physical or even sexual abuse. But we also have to be mindful and not overlook emotional and psychological abuse. This is one of the worst forms of abuse, one that we don't talk about as much as we should, but it leaves emotional scars that affect that victim throughout their entire life. So let's unpack just a few of these. Someone that uses financial abuse or abuse of that power. They withhold funds or means from their victim in the effort to restrict them, restrict their movement, their ability to do things and make decisions. Um, sometimes we'll see this in homes that may be a single income home where that person is using the fact that they're the ones that's bringing the money home to control the movements of their partner. Moving on to physical and sexual abuse of power. This is the most common form of abuse that we talk about and recognize as abuse, right? It can be seen um, when we're talking about abusing the children in the home. It can be seen in excessive or cruel discipline of the children. This is not discipline, but it's anger and a show of power to control the child in the home. It's used to instill fear. Sometimes the abuser was a victim themselves. You know, we see that many times with how we were brought up, some of the things that we, we face, you know, real talk, those, that, those of us that are from old school island backgrounds and upbringing, some of those things, some of the ways that we were create, uh, corrected were somewhat abusive, right? So some of the victims, um, some of the abusers in these homes were probably victims themselves and see this as normal behavior. Now hear me and let's be clear. I'm not speaking about reasonable corporal punishment. Many of us have children that you can speak to them and tell them and explain to them what's the right thing to do or why what they did was the wrong thing to do. And they listen and they obey and they learn and they grow from that. Other children will learn or conform to what needs to be done when things are taken from them, like they're put on timeout or restricted from going out or taken, um, you know, the phone is taken from them, that's enough to correct the behavior. And then there are some children, one that I had, where sometimes a little bit of a pow pow becomes necessary. So I'm not saying, and I'm not cutting out or controlling how you should correct your child when the behavior is inappropriate. But I will read this because many times when I go on scenes and I see um, people that, you know, have a child that's actually running the home and running the parents, the first thing that they say to me is, oh, if I spank her or him, 
I'm admitting people while you see me hitting the uh, screen. If I spank her or him, then y'all just come and take me to jail. That was a lie that they told <clears throat> to so many of the children years back where parents became fearful of correcting their children. And so as a result, what we have are children that are disobedient, disrespectful, um, un lack of understanding of authority or place or position in the home. So let me clarify for those of you online that might be of that same mindset. In the state of Florida, you can use corporal punishment on your child. Let me be clear. Florida statute 39.01 subsection 2, I'm giving it to you to the exact T, states that corporal punishment as a disciplinary action are not considered child abuse as long as the punishment does not result in harm to the minor. So yes, you can spank your child as long as it's not abusive, as long as the use of force is reasonable. This is also found in Proverbs 23, 13. Do not withhold correction from your child, for if you beat him with the rod, he will not die. We're all still here. This is a healthy guideline on discipline. My commentary in the Bible states that when parent punishes his, his disobedient child firmly in the spirit of love, let me read that again, in the spirit of love, he is doing the child the greatest good and not harm, loving discipline. But let's not overlook Ephesians 6.4 which says fathers do not provoke your children to wrath, but bring them up in the training and admonition of the Lord. So there's really good guidance and guidelines in the Bible as to how we should rear our children and how we should discipline our children that they might walk in the right path, right? So now how do we see abuse in the home as it relates to adults? Now this one, um, is what you would see a lot when you see the, the, the battered women and, and so on and so forth. But the abuse can be at, as something that you overlook, speaking harshly to your partner who should be considered your equal and not your child. Even if you're the only one working in the home, Notice that I'm not putting a sex or a gender to this particular type of abuse because I've seen it on both ends. Men are made to feel less than a man because their income is lower than the wife's. Language is used like, what kind of man are you? Or you can't provide for this family, or it's my money that's keeping the lights on. These harsh words challenge the man's very manhood that is abusive. Husbands on that side, on the other side, that the man that food be on the table, the children and the house be clean, the homework done on time and everything completed before they get home. And the wife's hair better be right and her body better be tight. After all, what were you doing all day when I was at work making the money? So come on, if we're gonna talk real tonight, we can be very abusive with our words. Now, it has even gotten as bad as far as the abuse in the home or the rights of, or, or the, the partners feeling that they have a certain authority or power control over their wives that we were even caught, unfortunately, um, at seeing a Seventh-day Adventist pastor whose sermon made the social media that suggested, not just suggested, stated that it was okay for a man to rape his wife. This is in the Seventh-day Adventist church. So family, as I close up, these are behaviors that are not only unhealthy, but they're dangerous and they are ungodly. They are far beyond the teachings of the Bible that's found in Proverbs 23, 13, what I just read, or Ephesians 6, as it pertains to our children, and the teachings in Genesis 
2, 23, and 24 that speaks to bone of my bone and flesh of my flesh, and the two shall become one, right? Or Ephesians 5, 25, husbands, love your wives just as Christ loved the church and gave himself for her. So finally, let's heed the words of James 1, 19, and 20. Let every person be quick to hear, slow to speak, slower to anger, for the anger of man does not produce righteousness of God. Amen. That is all I have for tonight. I just really wanted to leave it open for questions and comments so we can get into um, exactly what it is that the people attending might want to actually speak about or ask about now that I've given a general overview of what power in the church and power in the home can look like. Questions. Okay. Maybe we should, um... We can open it, open the, um, the line. If yes. there are questions, if there's anyone who has a question, you raise your hand and we will recognize you and uh, we will go on from there. So are there any questions you would like to ask Sergeant Barry at this time? Okay, so I'll, I'll, um, I'll go with the one that is in the chat right now. Uh, the question is, um, is it, is it necessarily true that, okay, there she comes. Okay, welcome Sister Antoinette. <laughs> okay, is it necessarily true that uh, the abused person will become an abuser? That's an excellent question. Thanks for asking that. Um, so we have found that people that have become or have been victims of abuse themselves can become abusive because they see that as normalcy. So in other words, if what, if, if what they experienced from the person that was supposedly uh, the one that loved them, that cared for them, if what they experienced at the hand of that person was abuse, they see that as an expression of love. So I'll give you an example. Many times we may have um, uh, women that are battered and the question is, why don't they leave? Why do they stay? Or if they leave, why do they go back? Uh, sometimes we can help someone through their situation. We'll use our victim's advocate to try to get them back on their feet, to re-educate, to reintroduce them to society, try to get them on some kind of level of normalcy. And all of this calls for counseling, right? Um, and then you would find that, you know, if we're able to get them out of that situation, we will get a call a year, two years, five years down the line with the same victim, a completely different partner or spouse, but the same person, if that makes any sense, the, 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 the same character, the same tendencies, the same behaviors in this, in another person that they've now uh, gotten themselves involved with because there are certain things about that that they are attracted to. They are attracted to what they can consider love as power and control over them. Okay, so if I am allowed, if I'm in a normal relationship and, and you know, I'm at work and I have to work late or I'm running late to the grocery store or something like that. And I come home and my spouse is there and, you know, they just want to know how my day was and they're trying to help me get things together uh, or tell me, you know, why don't you rest? Why don't you take it easy? I know you had a busy day and they go about making things uh, you know, normal, what would be considered normal behavior, someone that comes from a, a, a situation where that same scenario, once they get home late, will get, you know, a slap, a punch, a kick, whatever it might be, 
abusive words or language, um, accusing them of maybe seeing someone else, being somewhere else that they're not supposed to be. They see that as someone that actually cares and is concerned for them, um, that, that values them so much that they don't want them to be sidetracked or seen or possibility of them getting involved with someone else. They see that as love. And they see now this, what would be normal behavior? Are you okay? How was your day? I know you must be exhausted. They see that as someone that's actually indicating they're interested in something else. Something else might be going on, but the way that they process it is very kind of twisted, right? And so you find that people that experience abuse like that, unless they go through counseling and and let me put a plug in for counseling right now. Um, as people of color, and sometimes just as Christians in general, we believe that if we have faith in God, uh, and if we pray about it, that the need for counseling shows a lack, or the want for counseling shows a lack of faith that we, we, we don't believe that God can fix it, that we don't believe that, that, that God is the, the, the answer to all of our needs, um, which is far from the truth, right? God has allowed people to study in these areas. He's blessed people with the ability to listen to and help guide you through some rough places in your life. There's some experiences that people have childhood, adverse childhood experiences and different things like that that affects them in their adult life. Uh, and unless you address those hurts or those harms, unless you address those broken places, right? We might not be broken people, but we might have broken spirits at times. We might have invisible scars that have not been addressed or healed. And we bring that into another relationship, into an adult relationship, into a parenting relationship, into an intimate relationship and it becomes a problem. Counseling is healthy. It is healthy to share with someone, a third party, someone that you trust, whether it be a pastor, whether it be a professional counselor, outside the church, within the church, someone that is a Christian counselor. I am more interested in speaking to a counselor that is connected to Christ, that has a personal relationship with Christ, than being interested in someone that just has the title Seventh-day Adventist. So hear me, and I know that I might be stepping on toes. Wonderful if we could find a Seventh-day Adventist Christian counselor. But for me, the Christ-like counselor is more important than the title Seventh-day Adventist, right? So finding someone that can counsel you through those rough areas in your life, through those things to try to help you to, to get understanding and to heal and to grow past that will help you to not be a victim that then victimizes other people. Thank you very much, Tanjan Barry. I think um, LNS had a question. Hi, Antoinette. Hi. I'm <laughs> I'm so sorry I'm late. I was having problems on every technical ground you could think of. Um, Ellen S, you had your hand raised. That's yeah, Brother Shakes. Brother Shakes, you still have a question? Yes, I still do. Okay. But my mic is okay, good. Yes, thank you, Sergeant Bear, for your excellent presentation. My, my question is, in this age of cell phones, and when every member of the family always has cell phones, spouses have cell phones, and um, some people, whether it's not confined to one party, I guess, they keep going through the other's phone. Isn't that a type of abuse? It is a type of, I'm sorry, were you finished with your question? Yes. It can be a, 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 an attempt to gain control 
So you're, you're absolutely right. It is a matter of the understanding between the parties. Okay, I, I have some very good friends that um, a wonderful couple, they've been married for a, a good long while. It doesn't matter whether he grabs his phone or her phone to go to work. They, they know each other's password. They're, they're, they, you know, they share information. That is not a problem. They don't have any, any issues with that. Um, however, they're not doing it for the means of snooping or control, right? So it really depends on the intent of someone going through your phone. If someone is going through your phone for a means of finding out what you're doing and why you're doing it and who you're doing it with, that is a, a, a sign that that person has a problem with power and a problem with controlling you. I oftentimes caution my young people in the dating, ex in the dating experiences, right? Uh, one of the red flags to look for, one of those things that should be like a clue is if a person that is courting you or dating you all of a sudden needs to know who you're talking to on your phone. If you're talking to your your uh, brother or sister or a friend from school, they've got an issue with that. If you're sending a text, they need to see what the text is or who it's to. That should be a flag for you. You're not talking about a marriage that I'm referring to, a marriage of 20, 30, 40 years, and they just, it, it is what it is for them. You're talking about a new relationship, a relationship that's growing, that you're considering moving into a permanent type of relationship and already this person is showing indications that there's a trust issue or a lack of trust, right? So someone should not be demanding to see your phone. Um, if your relationship is in a place, again, a mature relationship where you don't have a problem with someone seeing, you know, looking at your phone or not, that is different than someone that needs to see your phone that's demanding to see your phone. So yes, that can be an indicator of an abusive tendency and abusive behavior. Thank you, Sergeant Barry. I have a question. Mm -hmm. Are there some atypical ways that an abuse of power can manifest itself? For example, because when we hear the term abuse of power, there are certain, vis you know, there are certain images that readily come to the mind but I'm sure an abuse of power can look much more subtle. So if you could speak to some of those more subtle, more atypical ways that someone can abuse their power. Thank you. Sure. So when you think of abuse of power, oftentimes right away, you think of some of the things you've seen on, on um, TV with officers abusing their power, right? Or um, politicians using their powers to go beyond what the scope is or to be above uh, the law, that kind of thing. But abuse of power can be something as simple um, as, uh, let's say, um, let's say in, in, in the church setting, someone that, you know, uh, always wants to hold a particular office or has a particular office. And from that office is able to manipulate uh, certain movings or, or movements in the church. That would be an example of a subtle abuse of power. Oh, this person does this so well and look at how this program is always organized or look at how far we've come as a result of this. Um, there's good and bad in that, right? Sometimes we have to be careful how many accolades we give people because it can, you know, subtly creep into if, 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 I, if this isn't done this way, if this program doesn't run this way, then I'm not a part of it. You know, that's abusing power because now it backs people into a, a, a corner in, oh my goodness, let's make sure this person gets it exactly how or gets what they want and, and, and how they want it because, you know, if they back out, what are we going to do or something like that. That's a mild case of how power can be abused um, or uh, trust, uh, developing subtle trust in people. 
um, we've experienced this, the Pathfinder example that I said, where, you know, over short periods of, you know, you know, periods of time of the child being under certain counselors and so that they, they develop trust and then certain things that may subtly become inappropriate is overlooked or, or, or kind of swept under the rug, even if the child brings it to our attention. I'm uncomfortable with sister so-and-so or brother so-and-so. And immediately we defend brother or sister so-and-so, right? Instead of listening to the child, let me say this. When someone brings an allegation or a suggestion or a hint of inappropriate behavior or abuse, you need to listen to that victim rather than be so quick to defend that possible abuser because it can perpetuate something that's actually going on with that person. And that person may not be the only one that it's been happening to, but was the only one brave enough to say, this is going on with me. So we as a church have to be very careful of that. Abuse of power in the home. Um, Something to the extent of, uh, you know, I'll, 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 sh mm, I don't want to say parents with kids going off to school because that's kind of like a, a, a touchy uh, subject there. But I've seen where um, it's, you know, you're going to do it this way or else. If you, if you don't, um, conform to this, then I am not going to make sure that you've got your funds for school or whatever. If you don't work in, in my business or at my store or whatever it might be, then you can forget about me sending you off to school. Whether it's that person's interest or not, that can be an abuse of power. There are other things that's a little bit more um, involved, but remember that the devil is always looking for just a little crack in the surface to seep in. It doesn't take a whole lot for him to get into something where we have created an environment that allows for his wickedness to prevail, right? And so, um, I don't know, were you thinking about something in particular? I do have a particular instance in mind, but okay. what you said did cover um, some of the things that I would think about. But so since you segue into speaking about children, are there, assuming that we're talking about regular caring parents, are there ways in which parents can speak to their children in order to help them to discern when they're in an, a, such a situation where the power dynamic is shifting in a way that's not favorable for the child? Yes. So if you're a parent that has spent the time to feed into your child, right, um, where your child is comfortable with coming to you with any, with any and everything, which is another dynamic that we as Christians tend to block. If our child, our children are not to question anything, right, especially if they're questioning something that might be our beliefs or practices. Um, and so if you have developed the type of relationship with your child where they can come to you with things that's uncomfortable, even uncomfortable for you as the parent, that is very important because then when they are faced with something, you know that they're going to come to you. If they don't have you to speak to, they will speak to someone else. And that's how other people that meaning to manipulate them or to control them or to have certain powers over them, that's how they get their way in, right? Because that child can speak to someone outside of the home better than someone in the home because the person in a home has a strong, this is how it is, this is what you're gonna do. Don't question X, Y, Z about this. It's not a matter about we do this because of this and, and let's discuss why this is why we do this. That's very, very important. And that is a way to help protect your child against that person that's going to take advantage of them. That longing to belong to someplace or someone that understands me. We hear that a lot. Thank you. So it seems what I'm hearing is 
one of the ways in which we can combat abuse of power or the manifestation of abuse of power in the church is to emphasize humility. You gave an example before of someone that has a particular position and tends to use that position to get their way. If there were hum was humility in that situation, that wouldn't manifest itself. And also, there is a kind of arrogance that parents, including myself, I'm a parent too, that we inherently have in that we must know the right thing all the time. And that doesn't speak humility. So if there is humility being exercised, then you will leave room for a child to express their, their feelings to you so that you can hear what is may not be said because the child may not come forward. So humility and um, leaving, developing a trusting relationship. Yes, yes. It's very important that as adults and as, especially as parents, I'm a parent myself, that we recognize when we are wrong, right? We don't always get it right. And one thing that I find parents have a problem with doing is saying, I'm sorry. I'm sorry, I was wrong about that. Or I'm sorry that I didn't allow you to finish that sentence, right? I'm sorry I didn't give you a chance to express yourself. It's okay if we got it wrong. We get many things wrong, right? So why is it that we can't accept that we might have been wrong or harsh in how we responded to our child? That's very important. So yes, humility, having a sense of um, the fact that, that or vulnerability, being vulnerable with our children so that they can see real life. You know, this is what, this is what happened to me or this is what I experienced. And I'm only saying this to you, not because I think you're doing the exact thing, but I see some things that I just wanna warn you about or wanna share with you. We won't share. We need our children to believe that we've always had it right, that we were born, you know, blessed and sanctified and, you know, we were saved, we were born saved and we continue to be saved. So we don't want them to know our pitfalls, right? But our pitfalls can save them if we develop the type of relationship that, that allows for open dialogue. Sister Alvida, I think you have, a, you have your hand up. Yes, I do. Um, continuing in that vein, I want to ask um, how, okay, is there anything wrong with being as a parent wanting to first know my children's friends before allowing, my, allowing them to, to, let's say, go uh, on a sleepover, go on a long trip or anything like that? Is there, it can abuse uh, come out of that? Can there okay. be abusive situations in that? Right. Okay. So uh, first of all, we have to think about the age and the age appropriateness, right, of, of that. Now, I know that there are many parents that allow their children to do sleepovers, um, you know, play dates that might end up being a slumber party or something like that. The children are 9, 10, 11 years old, 12 years old. Um, and in those cases, I will say, that not only do you need to know their friends, but you need to know their parents and not just their parents, but their parents, friends, and the entire family structure, why? Because you're allowing your child to go into an environment that is still unknown to you, because I can let you in my house and let you see the general areas of my home, and you can see me in church singing in the choir, but you don't know really what's going on in the rooms that I didn't open when you came, right? You don't know that I have a, a distant cousin visiting from out of town and he's staying with me because he just got out of jail and I'm his halfway house. You don't know everything that's going on in the home. And so for those that, you know, are okay with their children doing sleepovers at that young age, absolutely you need to know those friends. And then as your children get older into their teenage years, right? You need to know the friends. You should again still know the parents because these friends are going to be influencing. Remember uh, that birds of a feather thing, it's real, right? And as they grow, they are developing and learning together as children and as their environment permits, right? So especially here in Miami or just about anywhere now, everywhere has tends to become more and more of a melting pot, right? There are age differences 
between what we consider uh, age of, of um, um, consent to what others, even states in the United States that's considered age of consent. And there are certain states in the, in, in, uh, in the US that age, I think it's 15 or so, is age of consent to decide to marry. Or if they're coming from Europe, age of consent for, sex, you know, for certain things is much younger than what our age of consent might be, right? Also, the exposures might be different where someone coming from certain areas in Europe, and I'm using that because I remember going overseas to sing with my group and in us changing, we went to our rooms to change and the TV was just on and there was just open sexual activity at three o'clock in the afternoon on just the general channel. And it was nothing. It was like if they were looking at, you know, the Mickey Mouse Club, it was nothing. So now you have a child coming over that's now a part of, you know, your, your, your child's group of friends. And what they see as normal is something that we see as should be expressed in marriage. So it's very important that you know and understand the backgrounds of the people you allow your child to go in. And, 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 and I'm speaking very much from an outside space with this because my child is 24 years old. Um, and he was never allowed to go to sleep over. <laughs> Could be my profession, what I've seen or whatever, but when my child was that age growing up or whatever, sleeping at someone's house just was not an option for me. You can go hang out, have a great time or whatever, you know, but I'll be picking you up at this time or you'll be dropped off at that time. It just was not an option for me. And it could be because I was in law enforcement and I saw things, you know, you see it in the news, you see the little girl that uh, disappeared and it ended up being the Sunday school teacher. No one thought about it. They saw her going to the house and she was a Sunday school teacher or whatever. And she kept and tortured that little girl and killed that little girl. There's so many examples of things um, that go on that, yes, I'm a little um, biased as a law enforcement officer because of what I've been exposed to, but I also was raised, um, I, you know, in a Guyanese home and sleepovers was just never an option. You, you didn't even ask about it. So um, I know that probably more modern day parents are maybe more open to having their eight, nine, 10, 12 year old sleeping in someone else's home. Um, so if that is where you are, I'm not saying there's anything right or wrong about that. I'm just saying, make sure that you know the environment in which you're leaving your child is a, a good environment that your child will return to you in the same manner in which they left. Amen. Sister Pat Cutting, I think your hand is up. Oh, I... Yes, good, good night, everyone. Um, Sister Barry, this was back to your original statement in, in talking to and being open with children. We're speaking from what age? If, if you're speaking to them from a young age, it shouldn't be that hard when they turn to 24 and 25 even, you know? Exactly. It, yeah, so you, 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 it's age appropriate how you, you deal with that child and let them know what, what is expected, what is not expected. They're going to stray. They're going to, they're going to question because they're in the environment. They're going to see things on TV, on that, on that cell phone. They're going to see things. But you, you have to be able still to restructure them according to the age group. Yes. Yes, absolutely. And if you already develop that open communication with your child, if you uh, if they have the understanding that not everything they bring to you, you're going to be happy with, um, that there are times that they may disappoint you, but you also disappointed as you were growing and learning, right? I, I still disappoint. I am a forever learner is what I, I always say, right? But if you have set certain standards. The Bible says, bring up a child in a way that he should go. And when he's old, he shall not depart from it. If you set certain standards, certain um, 
um, principles in your home and the child understands why. As that child grows, you will find that there's certain things that they're just not interested in doing. They're not really interested at the end of the day when he goes out or whatever, he likes to have a good time, but when he's ready to sleep, he wants to be in his own bed. That was that's that is something that's just him, right? And you'll find that your child will develop um, habits and 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 um, characters and, and things like that that is conducive to their well-being, and that's because they were taught from a young age. They, they have open dialogue with their parents and they know that not everything they bring to the parent is going to be yes or not everything they bring to the parent is going to be okay, but they're going to understand the whys. And at the end of the day, Pat is right. They are going to make mistakes. We made mistakes, right? But right. if they know regardless of what, you know, I said, I, I hear this sometimes, um, a few times at weddings where the father would say, you know, if anything happened, remember you have a home, right? Just, you know, you have some place to go to. You don't have to stay in something or, or, or something like that. It's important that our children understand that regardless of what, you go to college or you go, or whatever you do, and if you make a mistake or, or, or you, you, you made a wrong choice, or whatever it might be, never be so ashamed or afraid to come back and say, this is what happened, or I need help. Sometimes we put so much pressure on our children to be perfect, to make the right choices, that they said they were going to be a doctor, or they said that they were going to do this or do that. And now, you know, this has happened, and, and, and it's not the path that we wanted for them. It's not the choices that we want. At the end of the day, we can have all the plans for ourselves and for our children as we want, but unless it's what God has planned for their lives and designed on their life, those are the things that will stick. Those are the things that will last. And those plans might not be our plans. So our children have to be comfortable enough to say, I messed up or I need help and not be afraid to bring that to us, therefore staying in a situation that they don't have to stay in. I'm glad you said that, Sergeant Barry, because my child is eight years old and just a few days ago she said to me mommy why can i only sleep over at sister nicole's and then i explained to her i said because sister nicole would do the things that i would do so with i know the topic is abuse of power but we also discussed how we can sensitize our children to being open to speak to us about things and also have a kind of discernment as to when a relationship is kind of off. And I believe that one of the ways in which you do that is to ensure that you, for me, sleepovers as it's only, as she says, it's only with Sister Nicole's family, but outside of that, there are no, no. There are some, they're even with family members. Why? Because those family members do not have the same values. They're, they're not bad people but they don't have the same value system I have. So sending my child into an environment in which I know she is going to be exposed to a value system that is diametrically opposed to the one that I maintain at home is going to put me in a situation where the level of influence I want to exert, where I need to teach about this relationship and types of relationship, it's going to be interfered with. So it's not only... You mentioned several things about, you know, not knowing the family members, knowing the friends, knowing the parents. And yes, there may be some nefarious character there, but it may simply also be they don't have the same value system that you have. And so may have that kind of influence on your child that you don't want them to have. There is a question in the chat says, why are people afraid to leave abusive relationships if they know they can get help? Okay, before I go back, and I'm, I might ask you to reread that question for, uh, for me again, I, I wanted to point out something that we see a lot, especially in island uh, families and, and, and relationships. A child might be reluctant to go to someone 
whether it's in church or a family member or something like that, it's a little child and you're saying, go give uncle so-and-so a hug or go whatever, whatever, say hello, don't be rude, go. And the child is reluctant, right? We need to take our cues from our children at times. We force certain customs and, 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 and uh, island things on them that can potentially set them off to not have that, that radar or that ability to discern when there's something not right, right? So they, they, if they don't want to go and hug brother so-and-so or sister so-and-so or uncle so-and-so, that's okay. That's okay. You don't have to hug them. They say hello from here. If they feel safer with you, say hello from here. Sometimes, like, like animals, where they can discern things that we miss, let's not miss it with our children. I, that, that was something I wanted to bring out because I see it a lot where they're avoiding someone and we, we're, we're embarrassed, grown. We're, we're embarrassed. We're like, oh, no, you know, they're embarrassing. They're making the person feel bad. If they don't want to go and hug on somebody's leg, don't let them go hug on somebody. They shouldn't be hugging on the person's leg in the first place. But if they don't want to go, they don't want to go. That's okay. I'm sorry. Now, what was that question? Why are persons that are in abusive relationships afraid to leave, even though they know resources are available to them? Okay. So from the outside looking in, that that way of thinking is very valid, right? We think, well, um, the government has resources. They have, you know, th th there's homes that might be available to them or they can maybe stay with a family member. Why would they stay in that relationship? There are many, many reasons why people will stay. Some of it is, um, influenced by their religious beliefs, right? Where they feel that what God has put together, let no man put asunder. Um, they have this strong belief that once they've married someone or gotten with someone, they have to make this work. They have to stay regardless of the consequence. This is what God has put together and this is where they need to stay. And so that's, that's one of the influences with that. The other, could be economical or financial, right? Yes, there's resources out there, but this mother, if, if this mother has two or three children that she's caring for, right? Finding a home, um, um, finding means, who's gonna watch those kids when she goes to work to try to, 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 to provide for those kids. I had a friend that was providing for her elderly father, for example, not an abusive situation, but I'll give this example, was it providing for her, for her father, elderly. She would take care of him. She'd go to work, come back at lunch, make sure he's okay. There was someone there with him, um, go back to work, come back. I mean, running herself ragged, yet DCF went in and said either she leaves her job or they're going to take him out of the home. So there's a lot of other things involved than someone just simply looking at uh, someone that they know is in an abusive relationship and wondering why won't they just leave? There's so many factors. And the best way um, to see what you can do to assist that person is to, if you have gained that trust, talk to them, see what is, what what's involved. If they're, of course, in a dangerous situation, then that's very different. Um, they need to, to, to come out and they need to seek those resources and that kind of thing. And we've been able to do that with many of them. But there are many, many, that, that question really, there's so much unpacking to that question. There are many reasons why you'll see um, someone stay, especially someone that has children. Thank you, Sergeant Bray. Um, Elder, I think you had your hand up and then Sister Pat, LNS. Elder Shakes, are you yes. still there? 
Okay, uh -huh. uh, I'm, I'm, uh, okay, I'm unmuted. Yes, uh, people are trusting of each other. And abuse, I seem to think, happens when people are close to each other. They know each other. Those are the people, I think, that often perpetrate abuse on other people. So what I'm wanting to say is that people tell people that they trust secrets and people use these secrets to abuse a situation. How can that be corrected? Hmm. That's, a, that's, that's a, uh, a personal thing, right? If, if, if someone is in a position of trust um, and you've shared something with them and they in turn uh, use that against you or share it with someone else, then they've violated that sense of confidentiality or that sense of trust, right? That's, that's something that um, as counselors and I know, um, advocates and things like that. One of the things that we take very, very seriously is someone's confidentiality and someone's trust. And you see that is a form of abuse of power. Sometimes you see people completely distraught in the church or in a family setting or something like that, where the very thing that they've entrusted you with, you use it against them not only put the information out there, but uh, let's say that there's a disagreement or something and, and you throw it back at them, but well, that's exactly why so-and-so did da-da-da-da-da-da-da to you. That is, that is um, such a betrayal of trust to use my misfortune that I've shared with you against me. So how do you prevent that? First of all, be careful who you talk to, right? Choose your confidant very carefully. Not everyone you can tell everything to, and I will tell you this as well, not everyone you should ask to pray for you, right? So choose them wisely. Pray, ask for discernment. God will guide you to who you should go to, not who is, you know, advertised as the person to talk to but who you should go to god will guide you to that person and if if that person has betrayed trust i will tell you a good way to discern that if when when you talk to that person they bring someone else's business to you that's a clue that's a clue right you need to be able to be confidential in whatever it's saying now it's different um if whatever they bring to you is an example or something to keep you from a pitfall with the permission or understanding of that other person, right? So I know I have a situation of something that happened with one of our officers that was devastating. Um, but she very readily uses her story um, to keep other young officers from falling into the same pitfall that she fell into. So that's different. If now I see someone or so, or the question comes up and I share that is because that, that story or that situation or that experience has been given the red light to yes. If this is going to keep someone else from hurt, please share this story. That's different. So the only way to keep that from happening is for you to have discernment through the Holy Spirit as to is there someone that I can trust? Is there someone I can speak to? You know, back in the day you would hear that someone brings something to the pastor and it's the sermon for the Sabbath, right? Those those are all betrayal of trust situations. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Sister Pat. You can you hear me? Hello. Yes we can. Okay. Uh, back to the um, the little analogy, Sister Berry, Officer Berry drew as far as the child, you know, the child, um, the parent telling the child to speak to Jane Doe or John Doe. I, I experienced that, and it and it it went it went hard for me. The the my husband 
my husband told my son to speak to uh, and the, the elder. And he said, I don't feel like, I don't feel like. And the, the elder said, what? Can't have that. And this was outside. And he, he's got, he, that's rudeness, that's disrespect. And then and, and he said, you need to beat that out of him. You need, you need to beat him, beat him, beat him, beat him out of him, beat it out of him. And he, my husband started hitting him and hitting him and hitting him. And I'm standing up there and I said, what's wrong with me? So I jumped in and said, enough of that stupidness. He didn't want to speak to you. He knows why he didn't want to speak to you. And, and, uh, and I stopped it. Whether I, 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 I might have been wrong in the sense of, I am not, I am, I'm, I think we're overstepping, overstepping my husband's authority, but, but I thought it was an abuse of power on both the elder and my husband at that time. It, it, well, not, I thought in the light of our conversation tonight, it was an, an abuse of power. The, the, the young man didn't, the young man felt uncomfortable and afterwards he told me why. Okay. and. Uh, I mean, the respect thing was, was dealt with. But even little Samantha, sometimes I tell her to speak to someone and she is not comfortable. That was when she was much, much younger. I left it alone. I left it alone because as Sister uh, Officer Barry says, children have a funny way of discerning whether they're right or wrong. You just have to find a way to tell them, well, you know, when you see them, good morning, good afternoon, good night, and keep going. It is not a matter of you go and say hi to Officer Berry because she's Officer Berry and you hug her up and all of that. You pass her, you make sure you say good morning and keep flying. That's so, so they would not say, uh, Samantha is very rude, you know. She passed me and she didn't speak to me. And I've heard that several times. She passed me and she didn't speak to me. Samantha, did you do that? Yes, mommy. So it, it, is, it is a fine line, as you say, with the island thing, it's a fine line between how we train the child and how we go about, you know, because these, the devil is busy. The devil is busy. The devil is busy. And subtly so, he, he can win, win them over to just come and sit on your leg and all kind of foolishness, subtly. Thank you, Sister Pat. There's another question in the chat. Do you think that men won't say if they're being abused because of stereotypes? Absolutely. So the reports of abuse, especially if it's sexual in nature, uh, the numbers that we have, whatever percentages that we show, those numbers are skewed by the amount of people that's willing to report, right? So even in the case of females reporting abuse, the numbers we have, we know, do not reflect the actual number of abuses that are out there. For males, even worse so. There is the stigma of, you know, that masculinity, that if you are being abused, then you are weak. I will tell you that we have judges, um, lawyers, teachers, doctors that are victim of abuse. Uh, we have majors in the army that are victims of abuse. And sometimes they become victimized, A, because they are trying to maintain a job. So I will say for officers, uh, people know that if you make an accusation, at least um, the way it should be, the officer is automatically taken, uh, put on light duty, the, their, their gun is taken from them and they ride the desk until the accusation has been cleared up. Unfortunately, there are spouses or partners in those types of relationships that take advantage of that knowledge and they are abusive. I've dealt with it with some high ranking um, law enforcement officials. Uh, one actually showed me his back that was completely scarred from the scratching and the, and the beating and all of that. And because of not wanting that person to go to, to their commanding officers, they bear it, they say nothing. Um, and it takes encouragement. I have to encourage that person to go ahead and report, go ahead and show it. 
and make moves that you need to make to, to develop a safe space for yourself. Um, but that takes a lot, right? It takes a lot for a man of any kind of, uh, that's trying to maintain a certain image to say, my wife is beating me or my partner is doing X, Y, or Z. That is not easy for them to do. They are shown as the people with the S on the chest. They are the, the breadwinners, the head of the household, the priest. All of these, all of these labels that they're given, Pat Cave did a very great um, example of this. All these labels, all these hats that we wear, right? All these uniforms we put on, all the masks that we wear, to mask what's really going on with us, but nothing that we, no one can just look at us and know our condition, what's going on inside of us, right? And so that's why oftentimes you find that men do not report abuse because it is a stigma. It's a stigma as that there's some stigma that people feel that they shouldn't go for counseling. If they go for counseling, then they're kind of announcing that they have a problem. No, you go for counseling, you're, you're understanding that you want to maintain a, a healthy relationship, a healthy well-being. It's, su it's such a warped way of looking at things. Unfortunately, society is fed into that. And we as Christians have fallen right into that same thing. I'm going back to the whole counseling thing again, because I think it's just that important. I heard uh, years ago, and it stayed with me forever. And I'm talking about it had to have been 15 years ago. I heard a couple that were counselors. They, at that point, when they were speaking on the radio, they had been married, I believe it was 25 years. And there were a couple counselors. They, they, they um, were family counselors, couple counselors, you know, whatever the classification is. I'm sure people on here knows exactly what the classifications are. And the question came to them after they presented and answered different things or whatever. Someone asked, do you guys go to counseling? And very proudly, they said, yes, we go to counseling at least twice a year as a couple and individually a few times a year because we feel that it's important that someone outside of us and we were able to express and, and kind of do a checks and balances or whatever it might be. And we have a wonderful relationship. We don't have any issues or anything like that, but we see the value in speaking to someone that's outside of this, right? Oftentimes we're in relationships or in situations and things like that, that when we're in it, we don't see it in everybody else around us. How many of us have seen a friend dating someone or, or choosing something that you know is not going to be good? And no matter what you say, they can't see it, right? That's the devil putting a veil. That that's the you know that that's the enemy using a situation to blind them to the truth. And so, oftentimes, when you're in something, you don't see it, you don't recognize it, and it can be a simple adjustment, a simple whatever. But you you never get there. You never see it because you don't seek anyone outside of yourself. Well, I'm praying about it and I'm trusting in the Lord and, and, and he will fix it and he will guide me. Or if there's anything, you know, I, I, I am a Christian wife or I'm a godly husband or I'm this or I'm that or whatever. And I'm following thus says the Lord and Ellen G. White said this and Pastor So said that. But there is so much value in getting counseling. Counseling wise counsel. Sergeant Barry, I'm so glad you mentioned about the stigma. I remember when I was 27 years old, I was still living in Jamaica at the time. This is almost 20 years ago. <laughs> and I was in a relationship that I knew I should not be in. It was a good relationship in terms of how it uh, you know, executed itself, but it, I knew it was not good for me. And I was questioning, why am I still here after I've recognized all the reasons? So I said, oh, 
I need someone objective to talk to, someone that has no vested interest in me emotionally, right? Yeah. So I sought out a counselor. Someone at my job found out that I was seeing a counselor and then started spreading rumors that I was mad. Mm-hmm. Now, I give that story. When I heard that, I laughed. I actually laughed. And the reason I was able to laugh and I was not perturbed by that at all. So it started to spread. I'm seeing a counselor because I'm crazy. Mm. It didn't stay long because I gave no ear to it. And the reason why I didn't give ear to it is because I had already educated myself on the value of such a thing. Amen. Amen. So I just gave that story to show that it is very important for you to be grounded in principles that you know are beneficial to you so that when you are seeking these things and they seem so aberrant to everyone else, you are still able to stand up on your own principles because you know this thing is good for me. Yes, very good, very good. Amen. I thank you so much, Sergeant Bear, for the wealth of knowledge that you've shared, for your perspective, for using your experience to give us this plethora of things that we can think about. And, you know, we've been challenged also, right? To we, we know that the abuse of power does not necessarily look powerful, right? It can take subtle forms. We also know that we are not to be ashamed if we are in such a situation and we need to share, what I'm also hearing is that it's so important. We just have to be realistic. Not everyone is going to go out and seek counseling, but if we are in a close-knit environment as a church where trust is built, then our women's group can come in, our men's group can come in, the AY um, department can come in where it's young people so that we can either encourage people to go and see counseling where it is needed or other resources, or we can be that source of support. Yeah. I would just like to thank everyone that participated. Thank you, thank you everyone that came on, you took your time. And we are now going to pray to end. Most kind and loving father, praise your name. You are the great counselor. We know that any help we get, whether we go into a counselor's office or we go to a friend or church sister, family member, the thing that helps us is what comes from you. I pray, Lord, that you will help us to trust you. I pray, Lord, that we will truly believe that all things work together for good for those that love you. Help us to focus on on our relationship and our connection with you so that that discernment that we need when we are in abusive situations will kick in, Father. I thank you, Lord, for all the information that has been shared. I thank you for the questions that have been answered. I thank you for the Sabbath, and I pray that you will be with each one of us as we now go to celebrate your name. In Jesus' precious name, I pray. Amen. 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 We continue to say thank you to everyone for being here tonight. Thank you to Sergeant Berry. Thank you, Sister Swaby. Thank you, everyone, for your participation, for your time. And we're looking forward to September. We will be sending out the information for September. And we're asking you, please, continue to join us. We will stay relevant. And we will keep on giving information so that we can grow. Have a wonderful Sabbath. And again, thank you, everyone. Thanks to our team and everybody. Thank you very much. Have a good night. Blessing. God bless you. Okay. Have a good night.